All right, so I'm going to get started because it's uh, 10 minutes after now and things are getting late in the day. So, oh, all right, officially, welcome to the very first ever Bigger Pockets po uh, not podcast, Bigger Pockets webinar. I'm used to saying podcast. Um, I got my podcast microphone right here. And uh, yeah, well, let's get going. All right, so, very first thing I want to talk about actually is the property itself. Um, this is an actual, this isn't just like a demonstration for you guys on on how hypothetically a person would do this. This is actually a property that I'm negotiating right now and I have been negotiating for a couple of weeks now and I got it under contract officially two days ago which is why I put together this webinar because I knew that I would need to go through the details really um, carefully and I thought I might as well show some people how it how it's done. So, um, why don't we start, I'm going to show everybody, I'm going to share my screen and uh, screen share desktop all right whoa that's weird all right so here is hopefully everybody can see my screen this is so hard without hearing anybody hey Aristo do you want to type to me and let me know if you actually if you see this same with hopefully. David hey David you're here all right somebody want to like Tell me your t okay, good, Rista. You can see my screen. You just said that. All right, so uh, let's begin here. Oh, I got a few more messages. Hold on, I'm gonna quit my screen share and go back to me again. Um, man, we gotta find a better way to do this. I am thankful that you guys are all uh, that you're all cool because I hate awkwardness, and this is really awkward. All right, so we got that, and and I'm going to add one more. All right, all right. So I'm going to go forward now. I'm not going to add anybody else. I don't think, unless somehow you, uh, I don't know, and if I notice that you're saying that, so. Uh, let's move forward, I guess. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen again. Screen share. Here we go. All right, I'm going to close off the pictures down here so that those aren't all added to the video. All right. All right, so here we go. This is an investment property article I wrote um, on February 15th. It's called How I Quickly Analyze an Investment Property. I made a YouTube video, it's already gotten like 1600 views which is pretty cool, um, where I talk about uh, a fourplex. Now when I wanted to write this post actually, here's the, the funny thing, I, I went to the MLS which we'll get to in a minute and I just went through the list of them and I picked one kind of at random that I wanted to analyze for this video that I made um, uh, yeah, a month ago. And the irony is that this actually property is the one that I'm pursuing because of this video I made because I worked through the numbers during the video real quickly and uh, I ended up uh, putting an offer in and actually working on it so um, I took a week or two before I actually put my offer in so out of the 1600 people that watched this video I'm really surprised not one person put an offer in on this property uh, maybe we'll find out why maybe we'll go through these numbers and figure out it's a terrible deal but I don't think so because I I'm pretty happy with it so anyway this was the thing it was at uh, you can get to it on the Bigger Pockets blog, biggerpockets.com slash re news blog. Um, and then if you go to uh, my pictures on the side, uh, right down here under editors, Brandon Turner, go to posts, and then scroll down till you find that. If you want to watch the video later, you can. Um, I just kind of quickly look at it from a computer in five minutes or so, and I figure out uh, whether or not it's a good deal or not. And so. Um, Anyway, so that was the property. Let me go over here real quick. This is Realtor.com. This is kind of the first place that I begin when I'm going to analyze a property. First thing I do is I go to Realtor.com and I look up the property itself. Um, now, if I didn't have one in mind, I would have to search for it. So let's actually do that real quick. So I'm going to go to the home page of Realtor.com and I'm going to search for, that's my zip code, 98520, uh, no min, no max. And actually, I'm going to go to advanced search because 
Realtor.com doesn't let you do multifamilies to start with, and this one's a multifamily. So I'm gonna get only gonna search multifamilies only in this location. I'll leave everything else the same, and I'm gonna submit. And I'm gonna see what comes up. So there's seven properties in this zip code that meet the description of multifamily. I don't live in a major big area, and this is a small um, zip code. So uh, I'm gonna scroll down, and this is what I did last time, and I found it. I thought, oh, multifamily, that looks pretty big, 119. 1012 West Marion. And I came here and I looked at this and I said, okay, well, let's flip to the pictures real quick. Uh, looks all right. Uh, it's got new water heaters. Um, you know, it looks kind of like your typical rental. Uh, there's really nothing that stands out to me in these pictures that, that seem real bad. That's kind of a decent picture. Carpet looks pretty ugly. But overall, it doesn't look too bad. So that's the first thing I do is I want to do that. Then I'm going to scroll down and read some of the, the information about it. Um, I know it's a fourplex because it says here unit four has two bedrooms. Unit one has one bath, a uh, bunch of stuff. Anyway, I know it's a four, bed, uh, a, a four unit. Um, there is other MLS sites you can use as well. You don't have to use realtor.com. Uh, I actually like one called themlsonline.com. Um, themlsonline.com. That's my favorite. Uh, but it only really is good in Minnesota and Washington. Um, I'm not sure all the realtor reasons why that is. It has something to do with, I think it's called IDX or something. If you're a realtor, you probably know uh, more than me. Um, but that's why. Uh, anyway, so I look at this property and um, kind of the, the general things that stand out to me. It's got electric heat. That's pretty typical around here. Baseboard. I don't love those, but they're everywhere. Uh, I see that it's four units. I actually own a property on the same street, so I, it helps out a lot knowing the um, kind of what I will rent for and such. So first of all, let's re get recap a little bit uh, of what I did last time on the video. Um, I'm going to go over to something, a financial calculator. Now this, this is my favorite financial calculator online. I like it because there's like no ads. It's just one page. It's great. Um, it's financial-calculator dot appspot a p p s p o t dot com so financial calculator financial dash calculator dot appspot dot com I just really like this one a lot it's really clean and nice so um, first of all let's take the actual number here the one nineteen nine and put that in for the principal one nineteen nine just I'm curious I'm gonna use a five percent interest rate I don't know it's a little high but I like estimating high uh, repayment let's go thirty years Taxes and insurance. Um, I'm going to leave those out for now. I'll show you why in a minute. And submit. I'm going to get a monthly payment of 643. So the very first thing, I guess this isn't first, but the main thing I want to show you guys first is uh, the 50% rule. You guys have probably all know what that is, um, but just in case you don't, um, I will uh, walk you through it real quickly. Um, let's go to. Let's go back to me again. All right, there I am. All right, so 50% rule. I wish I had like a whiteboard. Ooh, I do have a whiteboard, but that would be awkward to try to use it right now. So, all right, 50% rule, real quickly explained, you take the total income and divide it in half. So uh, I know that this unit has four units. One of them is a two-bedroom, and the other ones are all one-bedroom. I know average in my area, those are going to rent for probably 450 to 500 a month. Uh, so I'm just going to go with the lower number, 450, multiply that times 4, because there's 4 of them, and we get uh, $1,800 uh, total um, per month in income. 50% rule says to take half of that and just cut it in half, and I'm left with 900. That's how much money I have left to pay the mortgage, the taxes, and the uh, insurance. So. Um, not no, sorry. That's how much I have to pay the, the mortgage, not counting taxes and insurance. So I'm gonna go back to screen share real quick. Start screen share. I'm gonna head over to this financial calculator. If we paid the full price and didn't put any money down, which would be difficult to do, but let's say we did, our payment would be six hundred and forty-three dollars a month. And what did I just say? We have nine hundred a month left to pay the mortgage, which means cash flow doing that would be around two hundred and fifty dollars a month. That's just an estimate. Obviously, we want to go more in depth, which we're going to in a little bit. But that's just a really, really, really quick way to know how much your property is going to be worth, or how much cash flow you're going to get. That doesn't make me happy. I'm not 250 a month for four units. It's like, eh, I don't know. That's not so good. 
what would make that good? So here's a few thoughts. We can plug in some new numbers here into the um, principal. Let's plug in, uh, what if I were to pay 100000 for it with no money down? Or what if I were to pay 120 with 20000 down? Either way, the mortgage would be 100 Then I'd be getting 536 a month. That's my payment. So we take the 900 minus that. Now I'm sitting at, uh, what is that, 360 some dollars a month. Uh, that's not terrible. That's better. It's still not quite $100 per unit. So then let's say our mortgage was only for 90000 Now I'm at 483 So roughly 500 bucks a month for that. Now I'm at $400 per month in cash flow. That's the quick and dirty, easy way to figure out how much property you should probably pay for it. Um, that just gets me in the door of a building. If it, if it meets the qualifications, if at 90 I think this is probably worth it at 90 then I'm going to probably uh, go look at it and then offer 90 So, And we'll get to that number in a little bit because you'll recognize that number in a few minutes. Um, let me quickly check over on this page and see if anybody's commenting or I'm supposed to be asked, answering any questions yet. Yeah, looks okay. All right, so back to Google Hangout, back to my face. All right. Is this going okay? Hopefully, you really can't respond to me. This is so weird. All right, so let um, where should we go next? So we looked at real quickly. Um, uh, thanks, David. So David says I'm doing good. So the next thing that I'm gonna want to do, I already did the quick and dirty one. At this point is when I'd actually want to go look at the property. And so I would call up my real estate agent and say, hey, let's go look at this property. I think it's pretty decent. Um, I think it's, they're asking 120, but as I know it's a bank repo. Uh, if you really want to know how that is, why don't I show you real quick? It'll be fun. Uh, screen share again. All right, so this is how I figure it out. I go to Google and I type in Grays Harbor County. That's the county I live in. You can do it in whatever county you live in. And I'm going to go to the assessment search. It comes up here because I do it all the time. You want to look for your assessor's office. Um, not every county in the world has this, and you can see it's a really ugly, ugly uh, web page. But anyway, I'm going to type in the address here, and it was 1012 uh, West Marion. And that brings it up. I always do this when I look at a property because I like to know kind of the details of it. There I get a picture of it. There's a picture of this uh, fourplex. I'm like, okay, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, I got another comment, hopefully. I'll get to that in a second. Um, here I can get some information, and most counties are going to have somewhat of this information. You can usually find most of this out. Uh, first of all, I can tell that it says it's two to four units here. It was built in 1910. That's really old, and that would make me nervous. Um, and so I definitely want to check plumbing and electrical and foundation to make sure all that's looking good, and we'll get to that in a little bit. The county actually appraises at 150. Now, our county is usually pretty good. Um, some properties are undervalued, some are overvalued, but when I see 150, that still makes me feel pretty good about this. I can scroll down. I can also see some of the history of it. And actually, in 2006, it sold for 149777 So that was height of the market. That was when things were going crazy. Uh, it sold for $149,777. Uh, I can go look at the tax information, and I can see that the uh, taxes are $2,000 a year. We're going to get back to that in a little bit. Back to the assessment, and now this is what I want to show you. Anchor Bank is the owner. Uh, that's a local bank, actually. Um, they're not very big. There's a few of them around here. I know there's a lot of banks in the country called Anchor, but that's ours. And uh, where was I? Let's go back here. All right, so it's a bank repo. I think at 90 it probably makes sense. Maybe at 100 uh, I could put 10,000 down, and then at 90 it still makes sense. So that's generally the number. So what I did actually, here's the exact thing I did. I went and drove by it, and I went and looked in a couple of the units that were vacant. I didn't want to go and bother the tenants to look in the ones that weren't, but me and my agent just went and looked at it. One of the, there's one vacant unit, and then we discovered something really cool about this property. So this is the thing that's going to make all the difference. It's not a fourplex, actually. The property is actually a fiveplex. In the, uh, in the listing agreement, if you're an agent, you can see the listing information. It says that one of the units was decommissioned. And uh, that kind of piqued my interest when I talked to my agent, too, because I wondered what decommissioned meant. And what I found out is that 
Uh, I, I'm not sure if you guys are aware of this, but a four unit is really easy to finance. FHA will do it, any bank will do it. It's pretty easy to finance one, two, three, or four units. When you go five units and more, you have to go commercial, which means 30% down possibly. It means a whole different world. It means way more expensive appraisals. It means everything. So the bank that was selling this was smart and they decommissioned one of the units and made it a four a fourplex instead of a fiveplex. So now there's not just four units, there's five. So I hadn't I hadn't actually seen the fifth unit. Um, and so I went and looked at it and it's actually a three bedroom on the top floor and it needs a little bit of work. It needs some bathroom work and it needs a uh, carpet paint of uh, probably a few thousand dollars worth of carpet and paint and um, probably a few thousand dollars worth of bathroom. So let's just say it needs five, six thousand dollars and uh, really ballpark, um, but that's what it needed. So anyway, so now we've got five total units and that's cool. So we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, let me figure out where I want to go next. So we covered Realtor.com. Uh, we covered the property. We covered all that. So all right, well, I guess let's dig into the actual numbers then. I know that's why you're all here and you're probably bored to death here listening to me, but I'm going to try to wrap this up. Hopefully, 45 minutes total, so another 20 minutes or so we should be out of here. Um, so let me, let me find my financial paper here. All right, screen share again. Now you guys are going to actually see how I'm doing these numbers. So I know that was the longest intro ever. So this is my spreadsheet. This is actually a picture of my house because the last time I did this spreadsheet, well, not the last time, but when I made this, I put this picture there and I saved it in there and I'm too lazy to upload the new one. So um, this is a spreadsheet that I created. Uh, you can create your own. They're really, I mean, I think it's important to create your own. Um, there are some in the BiggerPockets uh, file place, which is biggerpockets.com slash files. Uh, you can definitely get, um, you can definitely download a spreadsheet there, but I really think it's important to make your own uh, if you can, unless you're in a big hurry, but it helps you understand the math. So let me walk you through uh, my spreadsheet real quick here. And this is what I use for pretty much every property I go to. I've been developing it and tweaking it over the years. So first one, section one, property information. This is just information I want to enter in um, so I can look back on it later. I'm going to kind of skip through that now because I don't want to take the time and it'll take me a little while. But I'd enter the address, the city, bedrooms, bathroom, heat source. The red numbers on mine are numbers that I want to remember to change. So um, if you remember earlier the purchase price, uh, they're asking 120 and I want to get it for less. I don't want my mortgage to be anything over 90 to make it make sense for me. So if I were to offer 110 and put down 20,000, um, I could do that. So let's say 110,000 and uh, all right, repair cost. It doesn't need very much. I mean, it's really, really basic. It doesn't need a paint job on the outside. I think you saw it was kind of ugly. So I'm going to leave it at 10 right now. Um, I got a maintenance guy that can do a lot of stuff. He actually walked through the property with me today. And uh, I know I can get it all done for 10 grand total. And it doesn't even have to be done right away. Most of it's stuff that can be done later. Estimated after repair value. I'm going to leave it at 139. Because um, if, and you know what, let's drop it. Let's be, let's go back to 120. That's what the bank's asking right now is a fourplex. Um, if I were to turn it into a fiveplex, get some more income from it, it might be harder to sell, but if I'm not in a hurry to sell, I like to think I could get at least what they're asking now if it was painted and beautiful. So we're going to be really conservative here, and we'll say 120. All right, so the first section here, the rest are just more of details. First section here is a, or second, section two, hard money fix and flip calculator. This is kind of how I figure out if this is worth flipping. I'm going to ignore that for now because I'm not going to be flipping this property. So don't worry about those numbers. Those are with another property. So buy and hold cash flow. I want to do this one for a cash flow, uh, even though I could probably flip this one, and we can touch on that too. But Now, it pulled the number from over here because I have it pulled from there. Purchase closing costs are probably going to cost about 2500 bucks to buy this. Repairs, $10,000. Uh, holding costs, I'm actually going to have no holding costs on this property because it's already rented. Three of the units are rented. One's not rented, but uh, I can get that rented pretty quick. So, okay, let's be conservative. And we'll say 500 in holding costs because of that one unit. Um, down payment, if I put 20000 down, then uh, I'll just say that I will. Now, you don't, if you don't have 20000 down, that's not 20000 down. That's not the end of the world, actually, because if you can make the deal, your down payment, you can make it work sometimes. 
Uh, for example, if this deal made if this deal was good at 110 and it was killer at 90, then I could offer 90 and I have a killer deal. I kind of made my own down payment then, um, because I mean I'd still have to come up with it, but the the money's going to be a lot easier to come up with. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. You can use partners, you can use hard money, uh, you can use a lot of things like that. But so the total investment, meaning the total amount of money that uh, we're going to have into this property by the time I'm all the way done with it, is 123. That's what the ten thousand dollar. Hey, Josh is calling me. I'm gonna ignore that. Don't tell him I said that. So, um, actually, he should be watching this. Josh should be watching this. Anyway, all right. So the total loan amount is 103 because I put a $20,000 down payment down. Um, now the math there, there's some tweaking there because I put 20 down. Does that include the these fix up costs? I'm saying that it does, but you can tweak this to make it yourself. But I'm just going real general here. 103 is probably going to be about my loan amount um, if I included the repairs into it. If I didn't want to include the repairs into it, I could say 30,000 then. So, average number of units, we got 4 units total. We got an average rent of 450 a month on those. And when I actually looked at oh that's right, 5 units 450 a month on those. And the 5th uh, unit was actually 3 bedrooms, so I know it'll rent for a little bit more. Um, but for right now, I'm going to leave it. Hey, somebody added me on Twitter. Speaking of that, let's plug that. I have a Twitter account. You guys should add me, and then it'll pop up just like that. Uh, my Twitter is Brandon at BP, so B-R-A-N-D-O-N at BP, A-T, BP. Anyway, all right, so total loan amount is 93000 um, Interest rate, we can say 4.5. Uh, it's probably about typical for a 1 to 4 unit right now. I could go a little bit higher if I want to be uh, conservative, so let's do it. Term length, uh, 30, 30 years, which is 360 months, making my total monthly mortgage payment four ninety nine twenty four a month. Um, insurance. Oh, Josh is asking, how do I join? All right, I'm going to... How do I do that? All right. Um, let me see if I can remember that, that link real quick. Again, I apologize for the terrible terrible awkwardness of this podcast but all right so now Josh is going to be joining us I think all right so um, total monthly expenses oh we're not there yet sorry all right monthly mortgage payment 499 monthly insurance so I want to hit the insurance next insurance is typically on a property like this you can call up an insurance company and find out you just ask them what would insurance cost on this property I'd give them the address I'd give them the information and find out I'm going to do a little bit of writing down here on paper. So, um, I contacted a friend of mine who owns a sixplex in the area. He also owns a fourplex in the area, and I asked him what his insurance was costing him. He said his was going to cost him two thousand dollars a year, um, but he's got another sixplex that's costing him fifteen hundred a year. So, you could probably assume this one's going to be somewhere in between that. So, I'm going to say eighteen hundred a year or one hundred and fifty dollars a month. So I'm going to enter that number in here real quick, 150. And just a reminder, this will go a lot quicker for people when you're doing this on your own. This is taking me a little bit while because I'm uh, trying to explain everything as I go and I'm completely new at this webinar thing. But um, monthly property taxes are, uh, hey, you know what? Pause real quick that, that thought. I'm going to add Josh to this conversation because if he's here, I should add him. So let me. That will make it not quite so awkward. Hopefully he's cool with that. I'm not really asking him. So, Josh, if you're there, I'm inviting you. So check your email. All right. So uh, let me go back to screen share. All right. Let's see. Start and screen share again. All right, so let me flash back over to my document here. Monthly property taxes. We looked at that earlier, and it was two thousand dollars. I believe it was two thousand dollars a year for taxes, a little bit more than that. So I'm going to guess that two thousand, roughly 160 a month. So let's average. Let's go a little bit more. We'll say 175 a month. Now here's where it can get a little bit difficult. Other monthly expenses. Now this could be anything from 
Uh, homeowners, assure, I mean, homeowners association dues, if you have those, we don't here. Uh, water, sewer, garbage. Um, this is a four or five plex, so there is going to be water, sewer, garbage. And I called a friend of mine, the same guy who owns the six plex, and asked him what he pays for that. Uh, he pays between 250 and 300 total. Um, he said his bill's never been over 300, so I'm going to go ahead and estimate 300 there. Now, this exact calculator is not going to tell us vacancy. I'm not going to put that in here, even though it is important. Um, I'm not going to put that into this one because I want to know the actual numbers. So, um, all right, let's see. That was my phone dinging. Hey, is that Josh? Oh, I thought I heard him. Hold on. Let me check it real quick. How do I get over there? I hear him, but I do not see. I see him. I do not hear him. I see him, but I don't hear. I, I, I see you, Josh. There he is. All right, this is Josh Dorkin, for those of you who don't uh, know Josh. We just got to figure out how you get sound in here. I don't know if that's a thing you're doing, Josh, or it's on my end. It's probably on my end. Is that working? There it is. Hey. Hey, wow. guys. Sorry to crash the party. <laughs> this is going to be so much less awkward now that you're here. Thank you. Well, I've got I've got probably about five minutes. Okay, um, well, it'll be a less awkward for five minutes. Right. Well, I just I just want to say thank you to everybody who's here and listening. I know that Brandon has been really excited about putting this together. Sorry for any glitches, any difficulties. We're we're still learning this whole thing, but our goal is to is to help everybody uh, beyond the website a little bit. And uh, I think uh, I think this is going to be great. So I just wanted to chime in really quick, say hey, and. Uh, um, you know, make it less awkward for Brandon. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's weird. It's it's weird without uh without having the talking back and forth. So, at least for a few minutes, you'll be here. I'll be here for another yeah two minutes. Absolutely. All right. So let's go back to. I think we're still on screen share, right? Okay. So I'm gonna go back over real quick to this document. All right. So where was I? We were at. Uh, total monthly expenses. This number right here is basically I just added the water sewer garbage bills, the taxes, the insurance. Now, there could be utilities, other ones that you could pay. Um, maybe electricity, uh, maybe your county has weird charges because they put a paved street in front. You have to make sure you check all those things because that's very, very important to make sure you get all the expenses. So, um, according to my calculator thingy here, which again, you should just do this on paper. You don't need a calculator, a fancy one. You could create your own, however. Um, you're going to get, uh, let's see, not counting the mortgage, our total expenses came up to 625. With the mortgage, we're at 1,124.24. That's basically all of these numbers combined. So, we figured out our gross monthly income, which is how much money comes in every month, um, with 450 a month uh, average rent, uh, five units is $2,250 a month. Subtract out the monthly expenses of that and we're left with I believe this number right here cash flow per month one thousand one hundred twenty five dollars a month that's at again that's at a ninety three thousand dollar mortgage um, we're at a, a little over a thousand dollars a month in a, oh no yeah yeah that's right um, cash flow per month one thousand one hundred twenty five so that's a good number. I, I don't think anybody could deny that's a good number. However, that is not the actual number I would get in my pocket um, because there's going to be vacancies. There's going to be repairs. There's going to be a lot of things that will go wrong. That's why the 50% rule is so smart. A lot of people look at this and they say, oh, awesome. Uh, I'm going to make $1,000 a month. And then they buy the property and then they end up making two or 300 a month and they're, they're shocked at why. Or they'll pay the full price. They'll pay 120 for the property. And Hey Brandon, was this the fourplex? This is the four now fiveplex. So oh, right on, right on. Yeah, so yeah gonna, fifty. Yeah. The fifty percent rule is so key, guys. I mean, you know, you you, you get a you get some uh, capital expenses that that pop up, and you know, a lot of <clears throat> a lot of new uh, new folks aren't going going to account for long term things happening. Yeah, you know, your your uh, boiler breaks after uh, you know after two years. It costs you ten thousand bucks, five thousand bucks. Well, you know that's you're gonna you're gonna um, have to include that, right? Yes. That's that's one of your expenses, uh, roof, you name it. Uh, so definitely make sure you include everything. Those vacancies, 
accounting for vacancies, even accounting for your own time on property management, that, that kind of stuff is, that's one of the big uh, mistakes you'll find a lot of um, new new folks doing is just leaving those those numbers out. And when you come back to it later, it's going to come bite you in the backside. That is true. That is true. Yeah. All right. So let's see. How do we... Hey, there I am. All right. So... Hey, Brandon, really quick. Yeah. I, I, I got to apologize. I do have to run, guys. Um, I know Brandon's taking great care of you. Um, please be sure to thank him when this whole thing's over and give him props over on the forums and let him know what a kick-butt job he's done. Uh, <laughs> but thank you so much for coming and checking it out. Very much appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you back on Bigger Pockets and, and hopefully at the next uh, webinar I could uh, be a little more involved. So thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, Josh. You got it. All right, so um, all right, are we all there? All right, so that that's how I kind of do the numbers. I really, I'm really thinking. I don't know. I'm really considering using my uh, my whiteboard here. You know, what the heck? If you guys got to go, if you got to head out, that's fine. But as long as we're here, let's do the whiteboard thing real quick. Um, I'm going to. The microphone sound might be a little bit weird. And I'm basically just going to reiterate what I just already said anyway. So bear with me one moment while I kind of shift things around a little bit. All right. So this is my whiteboard. I'm going to quickly clean it. That's my bookshelf back there. I have a lot of real estate books because I like real estate a lot. So all right. Let's do a few whiteboard things. Look at that fancy whiteboard. All right, so original purchase price was 120. Oh, you gotta probably be able to see that, huh? Well, this is awkward. Is it backwards? Is it backwards for you guys? <laughs> Risto says that's a lot of. Okay, it's not backwards for you. That's weird. It's backwards for me. All right, well, whatever. 120. Thousand was the original price. Let's do the fifty percent rule first. So at one hundred twenty thousand, we we know that it brings in. Let's go now. Now that we know it's a fiveplex and it's bringing in twenty two fifty a month in income, brings in twenty two fifty per month. Divide that in half, and we're at one thousand one hundred twenty five dollars a month. If we paid the full 120, we already figured that out earlier. If we paid just 90 for it, if I pay just 90, which uh, here's a hint, I offered, I'm paying 90 for it. So um, I don't remember what our mortgage was at 90. It was somewhere around 500 bucks a month, I think. It might have been 600. Let me figure that out real quick. Financial calculator, 90. Yeah, it was 480, 483 a month. So let's round up to 500. We pay 90 for it. We're probably going to be left with uh, what is that? $625 per month in income. That's not too bad at 90. So that was a little bit of whiteboard work for you. So what I like to do when I analyze a property is I look at that number and I say. $625 a month in cash flow. How much is that per unit? There's five units. That's a little over $100, 125 something like that um, a month at 90000 Now, is that a good deal? Uh, I like to think so. I guess it kind of depends on how much money I'm going to put down. So the question is, what if I put nothing down? If I put no money into this deal whatsoever and it cash flowed at a little over $120 some dollars a month, is that a good deal? Well, heck yeah. I mean, I'm not putting any money into it. Um, when we did the actual numbers, it was the cash flow said it was around uh, what was it, eleven hundred, something like that. So we know that the actual numbers say eleven hundred. We know that the fifty percent rule says six twenty-five. I'm always going to go with the more conservative number, and uh, I feel pretty confident that I can get six twenty-five a month out of here. Um, a few things that will also help uh, is that, like I said, that top floor unit was a three bedroom, which will rent for a lot more than four fifty. It'll probably rent more for six fifty. So there's a couple hundred more a month in rent I can get out of, get out of that. So my cash flow might be more more like eight hundred dollars. But um, I guess my for those of you who know me and have been following me around for a while, 
I like $200 per month cash flow if I put a down payment down, if I put 20%. If I put nothing down, I want $100 a month cash flow. Uh, I'm okay with that because it's no money down. I mean, if I put no money down, I'd be okay with $10 a month cash flow technically, uh, as long as I had no risk of uh, that money disappearing, as long as I was very conservative. So that is, in a nutshell, how I analyze a property. Now, a quick story. I'll just tell you what's going on with the property. So I put my offer in. They're asking 120. I put my offer in for 80,000. Um, just 80,000 even. I said I wanted a 10-day inspection period because I needed 10 days to make sure that the, I wanted to go in all the units. I wanted to make sure I had my financing lined up. And I told them I wanted a bank. I was going to do a two-month close, uh, which I typically don't do, but I really wanted to be careful. I said I was going to do a two-week close. Or I mean, a two-month close. I was going to do bank financing. Um, and they came back to me and said, yes. And then they said, and I was really excited for like three days. I thought, man, they just said yes at 80,000. And they never gave me paperwork. They just verbally said, okay, at 80. And then they came back a, a few days later and said, somebody higher up the chain said no. And so I uh, dropped it. Uh, I let it go. I was like, okay, well, whatever. A um, couple days later, they called me back or my realtor called me back and said, they want to know if you can do 100. They're, they're, you know, again, this is all verbal, but verbally they're willing to do 100. And this is not, this is not typical. I mean, banks don't usually communicate verbally. Um, but one thing I've learned about dealing with bank repossessions is every single deal is different. Uh, my real estate agent told me that one time. It's true. Every single deal is different. So this time, you know, verbally they said, will you do 100? I said, no. I said, I can do 80. And uh, they said, so anyway, it went away, nothing. A couple days later, they came back and they said, we'll go 90. And, uh, and I said, oh, uh, and I didn't respond to him yet. And then I got another call saying, or 85. And so um, that was really weird because they, they asked me 90 and then they asked me 85. So I know that they're, they were fairly desperate to sell. It seemed that way anyway. Um, and so I said, okay, on 85. And I verbally told them yes. Then they told me no again. Even though they already told me yes verbally, then they said no. Finally, I got paperwork back. They signed and said 90. The actual paperwork. The first paperwork I saw for the whole deal from them, it said 90. So I signed it and said, okay, at 90 it works, enough games. Uh, sure, 80 would have been nice. 85 would have been nice. And they said 90, and they said they would fix. There was a couple problems. There was a, a couple windows that were, that were leaking, um, and they had a – they're double pane windows and they got some fog in them. So they said they would fix the windows. Uh, they would fix a couple of the problems around there if I would take it for 90. But they wanted me to do it for cash. They wanted me to pay uh, cash, two week closing, and they still gave me my inspection. I said, fine, I can come up with 90,000 in cash. And, uh, and we're gonna talk about that in just a second if you wanna stick around and learn how I, I do that. So, um, so, we signed under contract for 90,000, and if everything goes according to plan, uh, I should hopefully get 625 minimum a month in income eventually. Now, here is one problem with this property that I need to deal with: is that if I buy this for cash, it means I have to, I can't waste time with a bank. So, in order to do that, I I have to use either private money, hard money, or my own money. Well, honestly, I don't have 90,000 dollars. I want to go and drop down in here. Um, I could probably pull it out of a property, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not rich. I'm not a guru. I'm not a millionaire yet. So uh, I, what I'm going to do probably here is I'm going to find somebody. Um, and again, I, I generally I recommend you know finding a hard money lender first. I know enough hard money lenders on bigger pockets. I know some really good ones, and I fully believe I can find somebody that will fund the majority, if not all, of this because the deal. Because I think it's worth it at a hundred, you know. Essentially, I mean, the, the property is going to cash flow, whatever I pay for it. I believe I can get somebody to pay ninety the whole thing. I'll probably cover the repairs. You know, it, it needs a few things that I'll have to do. That one unit that's upstairs, I'll pay to fix that up myself. Um, but I'm going to try to get a hard money lender or a private lender to fund the entire purchase. If I do that, then I'm going to refinance it here. And usually, banks require six months of seasoning. Seasoning is the time from which you buy it to the time which you can refinance it. They usually require six months. So in six months from now, 
after I close on it, I can go get a bank loan and pay off the lender, the, the private lender, the hard money lender, and I can own this property then uh, with no money down other than the little bit of repairs I put into it, which if I had to, I could do credit card. I'm not going to, but I could. Um, just if this came up for you and you don't have any money whatsoever, there is ways to do this. If you could get a lender to take the whole thing and if I, you were to do the repairs yourself using credit cards, and again, I really want to emphasize that credit cards are not the answer. I got myself into a lot of trouble with credit cards um, in my late teens. Not a lot of trouble, but enough trouble that uh, I used to fix up houses using just credit cards. And then when they didn't sell, I didn't know what to do. And uh, it took a few years to get out of that mess. So don't make the same mistake as me. Um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, I don't know. You guys probably have questions. This is awkward because I don't really have a way of knowing those questions. I mean, a few people that are in the chat room, you know, with me, uh, might be able to. Uh, let me flash over. There might be some comments. If you guys have any comments, you can leave them, and I I try to hit them up. Uh, any comments that are in the comment section. So, go ahead and comment right now if you want to ask any questions about this. There probably are questions of some kind. So go ahead and ask them. Uh, somebody asked, can you explain the 50% rule? Um, sure, I'll, I'll cover that real quick. Um, that might have been earlier when I, I kind of talked about it, or maybe they just came in. But the 50% rule basically means that it's a rule of thumb to quickly analyze something. So you take the total income, and divide it in half, and that's how much money you have left to pay your mortgage. So it's a good way to figure out how much cash flow you're actually going to get long term. So if uh, this property... If it brings in two thousand a month, um, or three thousand a month, or ten thousand a month, just divide it in half, and then subtract out what your mortgage payment is, and that's how much cash flow you're probably going to have. So, uh, looks like I have another comment. It's cool. That's good. Um, and again, go ahead and uh, go ahead and leave your comments, and then I'm going to touch on them. So bear with me one minute while I look at these and read them. Uh, and go ahead if you have any more questions. I know we've been here for already almost an hour, so if anybody has to leave, you know, yeah, we're recording this. It's not a big deal. So uh, let me go back to the page. Let's see. All right, I'm on the page here. All right, so hopefully that covers a 50% rule. Um, again, it's just a really quick and dirty way of figuring out your cash flow. And it's, it's really conservative. A lot of people will argue against it, and they say no expenses are going to actually be 50%. And in reality, they're really not. But it's those big ticket items. It's when you have a vacancy. It's when you have to evict. It's when you have to do all these things that you don't want to do that are dirty and that suck. Those are the things that add up to the 50% rule. So um, it's better to be conservative. If you can make a deal work conservatively, then you're going to be great. Uh, if, you, if you've got to kind of smudge the numbers and say, well, I think it'll work out, you're not going to be great. I mean, the property is not going to cash flow well. So um, Brian asks, so how do you calculate returns after using your hard money lender? So uh, if, I'm, if I'm completely understanding the question right, Technically speaking, if I use a hard money lender to fund this whole thing, if I get a hard money lender to fund ninety thousand dollars, and if I use um, if I use no money whatsoever, there is no. I mean, it's an infinite return on investment. It goes forever. However, I just realized my microphone's way over there. Maybe my mic will sound better now. Uh, however, if I use, let's say, five thousand dollars of my own money or ten thousand to fix it up, if I'm gonna have to do a few things to fix it up. Uh, if I do those, uh, let me go back to the whiteboard real quick. Show you guys how return on investment works. This is how you can calculate, you know, um, you know, keep apples and oranges and all that. Right. So let me uh, let me get back over to the Google Hangout here. All right. Back to the whiteboard. All right. So, if I were to, we know that the cash flow, can we see that, hopefully? All right. If I knew the cash flow was going to be $600 per month, 
We figured out earlier it was probably going to be a little bit higher than that, but let's just go with 600 a month for now because, again, I like to always be conservative. That is, what's that, 12 and 20, 24, 36, 72. Is that 7,200 a year? Just so I don't look like an idiot, I'm going to do that math here because I will look really stupid if I get that wrong. Hey, I was right. <laughs> That's awesome. I used to want to be a math teacher in high school, and then I graduated high school, and I never did another math thing again except for real estate. So, All right. $7,200 a year, that's in, that's passive income, essentially, because technically the 50% rule takes into account property management. Um, however, if you have a multifamily property, it might be the 60% rule because water sewer garbage uh, usually isn't counted. I mean, they debate. It goes back and forth. But since I'll be managing myself, technically, I mean, I have my own kind of management company. We'll be doing it ourselves. I'm not real worried. I kind of just balance those out between property management and water sewer garbage, and I balance them out even at 50% rule. So um, keep that in mind. Uh, and Risto, I see your question. I will get to it in a second. Just wanted to let you know that. Oh, and David's. So, oh, and Adam. Sweet. We got questions. This is great. All right. $7,200 a year. So now we got to figure out return on investment. So. How much money did I put into this deal? Let's say I had bought it for, if I had bought the deal for 110 and I put 20,000 down, let's just say that's what had happened. Cause that's probably generally more realistic. What people do is they pay a higher price and put more down. So if I paid 20,000 down, forgive, forgive my terrible handwriting. 20,000 down, and I was making $7,200 per year. To figure out return on investment, you just do 7,200 divided by 20,000. And that equals, let's do some quick calculations, 7,200 divided by 20,000. That would be funny to answer it. <laughs> I won't. All right. That was a 36% return on investment. This is if I had paid 110. If instead, to answer the question that came in about the hard money lender, if I pay instead, oh, by the way, 36% is awesome, right? I mean, Look at bank accounts, they pay like, you know, savings accounts pay 1%, CDs pay like 2%, stock market averages 11%. This is 36% cash on cash, meaning the actual cash that's in my wallet um, cash flow. This doesn't count the fact that we uh, have appreciation, that prices go up, that I got a good deal on it, it doesn't count for anything. So already this is a good deal at 36%. But if you know me, I don't like good deals. I like great deals. I'd rather buy one amazing deal per year than buy 10 crappy deals because a crappy deal is not a deal. You should tweet that. All right, here we go. If I had bought this instead for 90000 which is what I offered, and again, it probably takes about ten grand to get it into real tip-top shape. If I put in $10,000 of my own money, and again, I could use credit card, and then it would be infinite, but if I put 10,000 of my own money in, 10,000 divided by 20,000, that would be, oh look at this, I don't even need a calculator for this one, that would be a 50%, wait, I totally screwed this up, forget everything I just said, you guys are probably thinking I'm an idiot, I used the wrong number, hold on. Again, forgive the awkwardness. All right. 7,200 a month was what it brought in. So 7,200 a month, if I can write now, is the income it brings in, I mean per year. 7,200 per year in income. And I deposited 10,000 into the deal. I'm going to use a calculator for that. Oh, wait, no, I don't. 
That's 72%. Uh, look at me in math. 72% return on investment. So that's how I would figure my return on investment using a hard money lender because that's the actual money I have invested into it is 10 grand and that's how much money I made. So, all right. Hopefully that answers the question. All right, uh, a few more questions. Um, Adam asked, do you ever have any trouble refinancing after, after the seasoning period for the full amount of the original hard money loan? I have not had trouble yet doing this, um, though, well, I shouldn't say that. I've had trouble myself doing this because for a while I didn't have any job, I didn't have any income, I was just starting out, no bank would lend me any money. It was in the, the pit of the market and I couldn't get a, get a refinance. So I added a partner onto the deal. It was a flip that didn't sell because of the market. I brought it before the market dropped and I could not get um, a refinance on it. And so I added a partner and then there was no problem whatsoever. The partner made good money, uh, good income. They didn't have anything in the deal, but now they get 50% of it. So it was a win, win, win for them. And it, it worked out for me. I mean, now it's a cash flowing property. So um, I have not personally had problems with that. If you do have problems, you can do the same strategy, add a partner on. Um, I would definitely talk to a bank beforehand and find out even if you're close to being uh, able to qualify for that. And uh, yeah, so hopefully that helps. Um, David says, when you season the house for six months and then go for traditional financing through a bank, does it matter how many traditional loans you already have out? I believe so. Um, I think it's, you know, there's two main companies, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, that underwrite most of the loans or who buy most of the loans in this country. One of those allow you to have four mortgages. One of those allow you to have 10 mortgages. I don't know which one was which, but um, that could affect you. If you already have four mortgages on your name, you're going to have a problem uh, if you go through the whatever Fannie or Freddie that does it. Uh, you could always try a portfolio lender. If you guys watched or listened to the podcast with Arthur Garcia, it was uh, biggerpockets.com slash show six. Uh, if you watch that, or listen to it, uh, he talked about going to a portfolio lender. A portfolio lender is somebody who lends their own money. They don't sell it up to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. The bank itself lends it. They're usually uh, smaller banks. They're like local community banks. And uh, those guys will usually do a lot more. Actually, the people I talked to today, after my walk through the property today, I went and talked to a local uh, portfolio lender. And the guy said, oh, yeah, no problem. We can refinance that for you with no issues at all. He even said he could close... He said he could finance it for me right now, um, but they're going to need a good month to close, and I only have two weeks. So, uh, so yeah, anyway, David, definitely there could be a problem. And then let me just get this last question. Uh, maybe not last, but... Sure, Risto wants to know if I can explain again uh, how to use hard money um, to uh, buy a property. Uh, and then he asks the same question, is refinancing a sure thing? So, first of all, I'll, I'll, since we're on that subject, refinancing is not a sure thing. Um, definitely not a sure thing. However, to make sure that it's possible, go get pre-approved ahead of time. I mean, keep open conversation with your bank uh, from day one uh, because uh, that's, that's super important. I mean, I have a really good relationship with this bank. It's, I mean, I haven't had it for long, but for the last few months, me and this bank, the, his, the banker's name is Brian. He's great. I finally found a banker that I really can work with and that understands creative, how to use creative uh, means to get around things. I mean, legally, but just uh, creative. Like he was, he suggested, well, why don't we tap the equity in your other property to, um, to make the loan look better Then our underwriters will probably do it if we do this. I mean, I love that. So anyway, it's not for sure. That's why I think you always, always, always have to have multiple exit strategies. So my exit strategies for this are, First of all, I want to refinance it with this bank. If that didn't work out, what would I do? Well, I would actually, honestly, I would probably list this property on the Bigger Pockets Marketplace. I'm not just saying that because I'm plugging BP, but I really would. I would list it on the BP Marketplace uh, for when I'm finished with it for you know 110. Because if I put a few thousand dollars into it, um, it's probably you know it's going to look a lot nicer than the bank. It's going to have five units rented, hopefully. Uh, so I might send. Um, I definitely might. Uh, sell it. I it, I could even wholesale this property technically, uh, but I don't want to. I figured right now I could probably wholesale it for a hundred and probably hundred, but whatever. Um, so there's another exit strategy. I could wholesale it if uh, if right now. But 
um, I could add a partner on. I mean, I could go to a, a partner, somebody who's got a good job, and say, hey, you know, hey, Bob, you know, I've got this property here. Uh, it's cash flowing every month. It's working out really good. Uh, I got only a one-year loan on it because the hard money usually only goes for at max one year. Um, and I'm in trouble. I can't get a refinance on it. So I was wondering if you wanted to earn some money. All I need you to do is go to the bank with me and sign this paper and get a refinance in your name. And we split profit from here on out. We'll split the cash flow and we'll split the profit in the future. So imagine you're, imagine you're Bob and somebody says, hey, I want you to make $300 a month for doing nothing but signing your name. Now, can you do that if you're just beginning? You got to, I mean, you can, uh, but I have a track record. So I've got, you know, a, half a dozen people off the top of my head I can think of that I could go to, um, including my own parents. I could go to my dad and say, Dad, I, I need help with this. Or I could go to my wife's family and say, you guys want in on this deal. I mean, if it's a good deal, if it's cash flowing like crazy, if I've got it under control, if I fixed it up, uh, there's definitely that option. Um, I could sell it to an investor. I could list it on Craigslist. Uh, so anyway, multiple exit strategies is very, very important. So um, uh, re explaining hard money. Uh, again, hard money lenders are basically people who uh, have money. Um, there could be companies. They could be private individuals, but they have a lot of money, and they lend it out usually between, between 10 and 12, 13, 14% interest. Um, there's usually a few percent points that they charge you, uh, their fees that – uh, start up front. Um, so basically, and they go for six months to a year. Uh, I know one lender that will go two years. Uh, that's what hard money is. Um, definitely, definitely check out the last podcast we just did with Ann Bellamy on Thursday. It was the uh, most informational, like, hour conversation I've ever had in my life for just pure actionable content. And every bit was on hard money lenders. So if you guys haven't checked that out yet, check it out. It's biggerpockets.com slash show nine yeah and uh, yeah very important uh, very 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 good show I mean she's a hard money lender and she answers everything so um, and then let's see one more question here oh, okay Adam said and this is a really really good question the reason for my question about refinancing is because I've heard that banks are starting to appraise houses based on the foreclosure price and won't always approve a refinance based on the aftermarket value so basically what he's saying is a bank might look at this six months from now and say, well, Brandon, you only paid 90. It means it's only worth 90. Um, I have heard of that happening as well. Uh, I know that this bank, I'm hoping this bank won't do that to me because they say they won't do it. And I've had them, they've done another refinance for me and it was fine. Uh, typically, if you can show the work that you did and you can show that you got a good deal, they're a lot more understanding because a lot of it comes down to the appraiser. Um, if you can wait those six months seasoning, and some banks require a year seasoning, uh, but if you can wait that out, then you're probably going to be okay. Um, if you can't find one bank, go to the next bank, go to the next bank. There's a lot of banks out there. And if you, you should only be buying amazing deals anyway. And if you have an amazing deal, the money shouldn't be the difficult part. The difficult part should always be finding the deal. And uh, so that's pretty important. Um, I think there's a couple more questions here I want to touch on. And then we're going to wrap this up in like eight minutes, I say, because that's like an hour of actual conversation. So, All right, so uh, let's see. I'm a little worried um, that for the rent as low as 450, it must be low population intensity area, and isn't that mean high risk of the vacancy? That's a really good point because my, my area is a little bit different than your area might be. Because I live in an area, we have about 50,000 people in my county, and uh, our prices are very low. I mean, a lot of people think everyone on the coast, you know, the whole East Coast and the whole West Coast is really expensive, except for there's this little hole called Grays Harbor where I live. And uh, for some reason, our prices have always stayed really low. Um, so our typical prices for a single family house are 50 to 100,000, which is more comparable of what you'd find in the Midwest than in uh, the West Coast. but. Um, as for 450 a month, definitely, I'm not renting to high quality tenants here. This is not an A, an a or B neighborhood, an A or B property. And I feel 100% comfortable myself doing that. This isn't like a, a D or F or whatever. I mean, this is, this is like C to B area. Um, I own a property already on the street. I actually own my apartment complex. It's only like six houses down. And so I'm comfortable with the neighborhood because... I know it really well. I'm also really good at dealing with that type of people, like that type of tenant. Um, I don't know if I'd recommend everybody jump into a 
uh, lower income area because it is tough. I mean, I don't know. I guess it's definitely something that you have to decide for yourself if it's worth doing. Um, I think there's ways for systems. Like, let me tell you actually a story. So we went through these units today. Um, we went through all five of them, and one of them we walked in and the smell came out. And we walked inside and there were two cats in there, which they're not supposed to have cats. And the place was just a disaster. There was food on the floor, on the bed, on the counter. I mean, like just boxes of cereal spread everywhere. And there was bottles of pop just tipped over, tipped over on the floor. I mean, these people were uh, terrible. Luckily, the property manager was with us. And so she immediately called somebody else and they're going to start eviction on these people before the sale, hopefully. So um, that happens definitely with low income. Now, it also happens with higher income, but uh, it happens with low income. But that's why the 50% rule is so key because I, I assume those things are going to happen. I assume I'm going to have problems and you just take care of them. I mean, worst case scenario, let's say these people, if I had to evict them, um, let's say I had to evict them myself and I didn't catch this problem right now. An eviction is going to cost me $1,000 to get them out. Um, it's going to cost me another probably uh, $1,000 worth of paying my maintenance guy to go in and, or any kind of handyman, to go in and take their stuff to the dump, and I'm going to lose a little bit of rent. So I might lose $2,500 on this um, if I had to evict. Uh, that money is part of the 50% rule. And I have been doing this, this now for six, seven years now. I've been renting out properties. And I've never had to do an eviction myself. And typically you'll find that a lot of times that uh, some landlords seem to do a whole lot of evictions and some seem to do never have, have them. And I'm not saying that it's completely the fault of the landlord, but there are ways to get around doing evictions that you can, um, like for example, cash for keys, you've probably heard of that, you pay somebody to leave. Like if today, if this was my property today and I saw that those people had that, I wouldn't probably go and file an eviction like the property manager is going to do. Instead, what I would do is I would try to go to them and say, look, here's $400. If you guys are out tomorrow night and this place is spotless, this $400 cash is yours. Because you know those people are probably on drugs, and $400 will buy a lot of drugs, and they'll be very happy. So they'll book it for $400, they'll have the place clean, and then I'll give them the $400, and they're gone. They save themselves an eviction, the hassle. Uh, I get myself a unit back, and I save myself $2,100, because instead of paying $2,500, it's only going to cost me four. That hurts the pride a little bit, but, you know, you do what you do. So, I mean, it's all about the bottom line. I mean, I'm not going to wreck these people's financial future. I feel good about it. I don't need to get revenge on them. So, um, let me go back to the page real quick and reload and see if there's any more stuff. Let's see. <laughs> Derek said, awesome info. I own a few income properties and still learn new stuff from you. Well, thank you, Derek. It's good to know. Um, well, that's probably it. I better let you guys go. We've been talking forever. My voice is raw. and Next time, this is going to be way, way, way less awkward, I promise. Um, this was our very first webinar ever, if you even call it a webinar. So if you guys have any questions, email me anytime. Um, or post it, even better, post it in the Bigger Pockets forums uh, and tag me in it. Um, just at mention Brandon. Turner in there, and uh, I'll see it. Um, that way other people who are a heck of a lot smarter than me will see it as well. So, But you can email me too, brandon at biggerpockets.com. I'll do my best to get back to you. And uh, yeah, that's it. So until next time, we are going to try to do these webinars more often. We'll try to do different uh, types of webinars. We'll try to bring in guests and stuff. So thanks, Risto. He said thanks for all the info. Yeah. So all right, well, this is going to be live on YouTube, which is really embarrassing because I know this was awkward. And uh, a lot of people are going to watch this in the future and think, wow, that guy can talk for an hour and 15 minutes and not say much of anything. But that's all right. So you guys have a good night. I'm going to go eat some dinner. And uh, thank you very much for hanging with me.